Good evening. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at verses 6 through 12 in chapter 5 of John's first epistle to the church, and I left off by reading verse 13 uh, because it's such an important verse um, to understand and what we had just studied, but I didn't have time to really explain that verse. I, I didn't want to leave last week without at least reading that verse out because it's, it's so tied to the verses that we studied. And normally at this point, I would take some time here at the beginning to recap what we went over last week, but for the text tonight, like I said, um, it's tied unmistakably to our verses from last week and, in fact, to the whole letter that John wrote. So we'll get into our text for tonight and let it take us back to the truths to John, that John wrote about in previous uh, verses, previous chapters in this letter. And, um, again, not just the verses from last week, but the whole letter that he's written here. Um, what, he, what we look at tonight um, is um, highly connected to those things. So let's begin with a word of prayer and ask God to help us understand his word tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time, this opportunity to come to open your word, Lord, for that purpose of opening your word, to hear what you have said. I pray, Lord, that you would correct any wrong thinking in our minds, that through your Holy Spirit you would teach us the truth of your word, that we would be grounded in it, encouraged by it, strengthened in it. Um, well, Lord, we thank you for the power of your word, that it is living and active, and it has an effect on our lives to bring us into alignment with your will um, for us as your children. Lord, we're so grateful for the instruction that you give us. Thank you for the fellowship that we have together. Uh, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's look at the next verse in our study, like I said, which I read last week, but we'll just start by reading that one verse tonight by itself, and then we'll move on from there. It's 1 John 5, verse 13, okay? John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So, let's start by asking ourselves a couple of questions. Okay, John is drawing the reader's attention to the fact that he's written, okay? And the first two questions that we should ask uh, or that I'll ask you are, who's John writing to, and what are these things he has written? Who's John writing to? Christians, okay? What are these things? He says, these things. What are they? That's trickier. Basically, everything he's written. <laughs> Nothing specific there, but... Um, Everything he's written in this letter, he's written all these things. We have to remember, like, we break this up into weeks of verses here and there, and we move along, but as this letter is being read in a congregation, they read out the whole thing. So they're hearing all of this, so it, there's a flow to it that we sometimes can miss out on because we work our way through, um, through a text trying to understand it more. It's not a bad thing, but we do have to realize that, that these were written in such a way that there's a flow to them. There's a reason for the way the authors wrote Scripture. So, of course, those are the easy answers to those questions, right? He's writing to Christians, and his references to these things is about everything that preceded verse 13. Um, but that's the easy way out, and I want to spend a bit more time uh, to inform our thinking about verse 13, to inform our thinking with the rest of the Scriptures that he's written so that we can properly apply verse 13 and benefit from that verse as Christians. Okay, so he is writing to Christians. He said, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Those are Christians. That's what he's talking about. Okay, we should notice, though, and understand that John's not being inclusive here. Okay? He would kind of clash with our culture. He's, he's not really being inclusive. He's making... Uh, or he's being exclusive, really. Okay? He's, he's not trying to open a wide door of belief options so that everyone can feel welcomed and appreciated for 
their thoughts on things. He's, he's closing any and every door to salvation except this one door, all right? This one way of having fellowship with God and to have that fellowship restored from the fact that sin separated that fellowship. So for those who might think John is going out on his own here or out of bounds, he's not. This is what Jesus did as well. Matthew seven thirteen. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. In John 14, 6, of course, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is exclusive, right? It's not everything goes. Biblical Christianity, honestly, is widely hated because it doesn't bow to the sort of choose-your-own-adventure Christianity or choose-your-own-adventure spirituality that we see so prevalent in our culture. Um, Of course, we know that that's how the world works. We can expect that from the world. But so many want to call themselves Christians and reject Christ. They, They wouldn't say they reject Christ, But in reality, they're rejecting Christ. Uh, They they want to say they're Christians, but define what that means for themselves. They want to even define God for themselves. But humanity does not know anything about God or salvation through His Son by human wisdom. We don't know by that. It all comes from the Word of God, what God has revealed to us about Himself. So to think that human beings can come up with something and get it right uh, is a pretty crazy thought. And here in this short letter, as we've been going through this, John has said a lot about what makes someone a Christian or about who can rightly claim to be a Christian. And I'll tell you right now that these statements uh, that John has made in this letter are not accepted by the world. And unfortunately, they are not even accepted among many who say they're Christians. That's the point, though. That's that's why John had to write this letter. Uh, Because false Christians were confusing true Christians with lies about Jesus and the way of salvation. Remember, we talked about the Gnostics and all that. These are people who would claim Christ in some fashion. But they had it wrong, and they were confusing people. And so John had to write this letter to clear things up. John is called out in this letter, in this short letter. I mean, we're in chapter 5, and that's the last chapter. It's a pretty short letter. But he's called out those false Christians in this letter many times and said particular things about them, identifying them for who they are. And he's, he said they are those who, here's a, here's a long list that's throughout this, this letter that we've gone through. They are those who lie and do not practice the truth. Okay, they deceive themselves so that the truth is not in them. They make God a liar and don't have His Word in them. They don't keep His commandments and so are liars without the truth in them. They are in darkness because they hate their brother even though they claim they are in the light. They are blinded by the darkness and have no clue where they're going. They love the world so they don't have the love of the Father in them. They do not continue in fellowship with believers. They leave because they were never believers in the first place. Okay, they are deniers of Jesus as he's revealed in the Bible and are therefore liars, antichrists, and those who do not have the Father. They are deceivers trying to convince true Christians to follow their deception. They're of the world, cannot even recognize true Christianity. They continue in their sin without repentance, proving to be lawless, never having known Jesus. They continue in their sin because they are children of the devil. They do not practice righteousness because they do not love their brother uh, and are therefore not from God but from the devil. They do not love, so they abide in death. They hate their brothers, so they are murderers who do not have eternal life. They teach a false Jesus or no Jesus and are therefore antichrists. 
They will not listen to the truth. They do not love and therefore can't know God. They do not believe God's own testimony regarding His Son, as we saw last week. They do not have the Son, so they do not have the Father, and they do not have eternal life. That's a lot of things that he has said about unbelievers in this short letter. It's it's a big list. And it's all centered around the truth, the Word of God. They may claim to have God, but they don't. They may claim to have Christ, but they don't. Okay? It's, it's centered around the truth of the Word of God as inspired by the Holy Spirit and written down so that we can know God and know His Son unto salvation. Right? In all of that stuff, where, where are the works? Where are the good deeds? Where are the multiple paths? They're not there. Because biblical Christianity is exclusive. So back to the question. Who's John writing to? Christians. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. That was in chapter 4, verse 15. Again, this confession is that Jesus is exactly who God says he is and has done everything that God says he has done as revealed in the Scriptures, and that every other supposed way is false. Every other way is a lie from the devil that men have believed by suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. God doesn't make allowances for other religions or belief systems. He will destroy Satan. He will destroy every false belief, and He will destroy every follower of false beliefs because of what the Scripture says. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that is Jesus Christ. So to the unbeliever or false Christian, this verse and and all of John's teaching coming up to it, to the unbeliever or the false Christian, that's a a terror. These verses are, are a terror. Right? But to you and I who have believed in the true biblical Jesus Christ and His redemptive work on the cross, this text and the text that we've read beforehand are joy. They are joyous to us. We should, we should view them that way. Okay? It's, it, this text is a life-giving text. It comforts. It casts out lies. It corrects wrong thinking because of Circumstances. Sometimes our circumstances cause us to think a particular thing or have our thoughts go down a particular road that isn't true because we haven't remembered the truth. So why should we listen to this? Well, because. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 from last time. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So what is eternal life? I can't remember if I've asked you that before. What is, what is eternal life? Maybe you've never thought about that. Right, life with Christ starts here and extends on into eternity as we're with, with Him. It's true. Eternal life is not, it's not just existing forever. Right? If we think of it as, oh, I just I have to exist forever. Well, then we think of it in terms of our earthly lives, which are hard. They're a struggle, right? If we had to exist like this forever, that'd be terrible. But that's not what eternal life is. It's not just existing forever. It is living, eternal life. It's living forever as Charity said, in the presence of the Lord. And it's without personal sin. It's without the sins of others affecting you. It's praising the goodness and mercy of our Savior forever. I mean, just the fact that there won't be sin is enough to make eternal life worth it. That's what John wanted for the church. He, He wanted to rejoice in the lives of people who believe the gospel 
unto salvation and had true fellowship with God restored through Christ. That's how he started this letter. I mean, it was a long time ago, I know, but we read it. That's how he started it. He, he said at the beginning why he wrote this. If you want to flip back over to chapter 1 of 1 John, look at verses 1 through 3. Remember this verse that we just read tonight. First of all, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. He says, I write these things, right? Let's look at the first three verses of the first chapter. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And verse 4 there says, And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. John wanted them to believe and to know the truth. He wanted them to know and believe uh, the true biblical and only Jesus Christ and the true biblical only way of salvation. It's all about believing God, which we sometimes call faith, right? Uh, they're, They're interchangeable. Do you believe what the Father has testified to in His Word concerning His Son, Jesus Christ? That's the question. If you do, You'll repent, put your trust in what God has testified to and promised those who believe. What has He promised? Eternal life. Completely apart from any initiative on your, on your own, or completely apart from any self-righteousness on your part. Okay. Why is eternal life on that basis not enough for some people? Why can't they submit to this? They don't understand it, for sure. They don't want to give up their sin. There you go. Right? They want this life now. Yeah, they're very short-sighted. It goes along with they don't want to give up their sin. Right? Um, to, to submit to this, to submit to God's way of salvation is difficult. It's, in fact, impossible without God's intervention. People don't like it because it says that they can't do anything about their condition. We want to be able to do something, right, about our situation, our sin problem. It says they're not in control. God is. People don't like it when they don't have control, when they don't have a say in something. People don't like that. And And people love their sin. It's probably the biggest problem. People love their sin. John 3, 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. It's pretty plain, right? Sin. And you would think, right? We we would think that... Even in light of that, right, that we love the darkness rather than the light, we would think that when presented with this gospel gift, this this way of salvation through the work of someone else on our behalf, you would think that we would like that. You would think we would receive that joyfully as the greatest gift of love that will ever be offered to you, which it is. But they can't because... They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They love their sins. Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh, okay, that's the unbelieving mind, it's hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It's impossible. What's the answer? Well, the power of the gospel. That's the answer. So, That's what John's writing this letter. He wants people to contemplate these things. Each professing believer must ask themselves the question, is that verse 
and, and all the teaching around it, our verse from tonight and all the teaching around it, is that a terror to me or is it a joy? John says he wrote these things so that you can know you have eternal life. Apparently, you can know. Right? We've been looking at that all along. He, he's, he said that we can know. To have the, the Father and to have the Son because you have believed the Father's testimony concerning Jesus does not only bring about eternal life, but it brings about a confidence in the Christian that's not available to anyone else. Christians can have a confidence that no one else can have. No other religion or religious system offers people assurance. It offers you a maybe. Everything else offers you a maybe. Might be. If you this. If you that. Might be. But Christianity offers something different. It offers a confidence. This is uh, this is not and never is self-confidence, okay? That's every other religious system. If you this, if you that, that's all self, self-confidence. This is a confidence towards God. Let's look at the next verses, verses 14 and 15, 1 John 5. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. Again, these words are specifically for you and me as Christians. If you are a Christian, these words apply to you. So what's John teaching us here? First, I want to ask, which portion of that passage, specifically in verse 14, is commonly overlooked or left out? In his will. Absolutely. Eh, you know, I don't, I don't need that little part. That's not important, right? I like, every, I like that verse, except for that part. That's, that's kind of how it comes out. Whether people intentionally leave that out, or it's just like some automatic thing because we're sinners that we don't want to submit to God, that we can sort of tune those, those verses out, or those words out, according to His will. That's, that's a key part of this passage. Other than not being biblically accurate, what problems result from leaving that phrase out? If we left that phrase out, that passage would not be biblically accurate. But other than that, what other problems result from leaving that passage or that phrase out? Okay. So according to our will instead of His will. Right. It's kind of an automatic, right? If we leave out the God's will part... Well, by default, what's left? My will. I'm not going to do it according to your will. I'm sure if I'm not doing it according to God's will, I'm certainly not going to do it according to your will. It defaults to me, right? What else? What are some other problems that result from leaving out that phrase? Okay, it, those we pray, and the prayers aren't answered, we begin to lose faith, right? God is not answering my prayers, which is true, but we've believed something false about this passage, and it's leading us down a road where our minds shouldn't, shouldn't go. People have a wrong, this leads people to have a wrong understanding about prayer and how God answers it, has, it leads to a wrong view of the sovereignty of God when we leave that phrase out. It leads to a faith that is shaken, like Matt just talked about. Because you've been taught a particular thing, and so when you, when you perceive that your prayers aren't being answered, you're left to wonder and think, why not? What's going on? What's wrong with me? What did I do? We need to understand God. It leads to other unbiblical teaching. Or thoughts like, well, you must be sinning. Okay, let's take that for a second. That's true. Sin can hinder our prayers. But that's not always true. Okay, to say my prayers aren't answered and someone says, well, you're sinning. There's sin in your life somehow. Well, they don't know that. And that's not necessarily true. It could be true. But it's leaving out even the, the possibility that it could be that 
I've prayed something that wasn't in accordance with God's will. Or, you must have a curse on you, right? Or, your prayers aren't answered because you're thinking or speaking negatively, right? You, so God won't answer. You need to make a positive confession. Okay, this is superstition. That's not true. All these and more that we could come up with probably do, can and do result from leaving out the fact that God does what He wants to do. God acts according to His own will, not your will, not my will. He does what He wants to do. John is teaching Christians, God is going about His work in His world according to His purposes in the counsel of Himself to accomplish everything He said He would do, period. When when you pray for something that's outside of the realm, of that realm, it will not be answered, period. God doesn't answer prayers for things that are outside of His will. If He did, it would cease to be His will. He would be doing my will or your will. It, It should be clear to us as Christians that God is sovereign and in perfect control over everything because He's doing everything according to what He wants to do. Everything will work out how He wants it to always. God is not out of control. Things don't surprise God. Things don't not work out for Him, right? It always works out exactly how He wants it to work out. Is that ever true for you? Do things always work out exactly the way you plan them to work out or that you think they should work out? No. Well, why not? why Why wouldn't they always work out? What? We're not God. Okay. Bottom line, we're not God. What else? Well, there's some other reasons why things don't always work out the way that we plan them. Okay, we don't always know what's best. Absolutely. Humans are involved, right? Okay. Yeah. And we, that's kind of a statement that suggests humans are fallible. Humans are sinful, right? We can't see into the future. Right? We, we can't see all the angles. We can't see the big picture. God can see everything. Always. We don't always desire what's good. Not only do we not always know what's best for ourselves or even for others, but we don't even always desire what's good. We th- may think we're asking for something that's good, but it's not good. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says, For as the rain and the snow Come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Is there any hint of things not working out there? No. Not at all. <clears throat> in chapter 1 of Ephesians, just, just in that one chapter, there are seven ways that Paul describes how God does things regarding his plans for all things, including salvation. Just in that one chapter, it's these seven things. I'm not going to read all the verses, but I just want to point out these seven phrases that talk about God. In uh, verse 5 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, according to the purpose of his will. And he's talking about salvation. He's talking about how he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, verse 6. According to the riches of his grace, verse 7. In all wisdom and insight, verse 8. According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, verse 9. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, verse 11, and according to the working of his great might, verse 19. Okay, where, where was your contribution or my contribution in all that? Okay, where did God include us in the planning and carrying out of his will? How, how were you involved in that? 
I wasn't. There's a whole section in Job where God chastises Job and his friends for all their words without wisdom. And he puts them in their place and says about himself with a whole few chapters there of God talking about how he created everything. He says, where were you when I did this, when I did that? Where were you? Oh, they weren't there. <laughs> That's the point. Okay, God is, God is sovereign. God does what God wants to do. Okay, we're not involved in the planning. We're not involved in making things come about. Let's look over in Isaiah 46, if you would. Isaiah 46, verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> and let's hear what the Word says about God. Isaiah 46, 8 through 11. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. 8 through 10 is what I meant to say. I will accomplish all my purpose. Does that sound like there's any chance that something won't work out the way God wants it to? Does it sound like he still has to figure something out or he's still working out all the details? No. It, it, that's not God. That's not a description of God. This is a description of God. All things will work out according to his purposes. And that can, that can all, all those passages we've just looked at, it can, it can all be summed up by saying God's will is all that matters in this life. For the Christian, from our viewpoint, God's will is all that matters. It's all that should matter. It's all that is, His will is all that is truth. It's all that is righteous and good and best. And if we ask anything according to that, God hears us. That's what John is saying in verse 14. It's a simple concept, really. But we just, we don't, we don't know it. We, we can't always see it. Lots of times we forget it. In the midst of circumstances, we, we forget sometimes that God is sovereign, that all things will work out according to His purposes. Sometimes we just don't like it. I want what I want. I can maybe even convince myself it is right. The fact is, Scripture promises our prayers will be heard if they line up. Now, John says, God will hear our prayers. He will hear our prayers. He's not talking about uh, God hearing as opposed to not hearing, like he was busy doing something, he missed it, um, you know, or, or he's out of town or something like that. That's not, that's not what he's talking about. God hears everything that every person ever says. In fact, God hears every thought that every person ever has. In fact, he knows those thoughts before you think them. Wrap your mind around that. That's not what John means. He doesn't mean that God misses something. Okay? John's talking about hearing with listening. Not, not in the sense that uh, God is learning from us or never thought of it that way when we pray something, but in the sense that God will give attention to this prayer because to answer that prayer in the way that we prayed it means that prayer lined up with the will of God. And from our perspective, maybe you know people in your life who it seems like their prayers are always answered the way they ask them. Well, chances are that person prays in line with the will of God. <laughs> if their prayers seem to always be answered the way they ask them, they're not asking frivolous things. They're not asking silly things or ungodly things, or asking wrongly. Chances are they're asking because they're in the will of God. God does not hear the prayers 
of unbelievers. As John wrote about in John 9, 31, when the man born blind was healed, you know, he declared, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, God listens to him. Again, the will of God is in there. That's a key part of that. And a whole section about being worldly and Going after our own will and desires, James said this, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, in James 4.3. Then he chastises the people for being worldly and calls them adulterers. Their thinking is all messed up. Their thinking is ungodly. It's, their thinking is devoted to self and their own desires, not in the will of God. They ask wrongly. It's not about the wrong words. You said the wrong words. You've got to say the right words. It's the motives. It's what you're asking and why. But for believers, John's pointing out in our passage that this is a promise from God. You will have whatever you ask for from God if you ask in accordance with His will. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a, it's a spectacular promise that we just kind of let go sometimes. A lot of the time. The question is, how do we pray according to His will? What are some ways that we can pray according to the will of God? What do you think? Read Scripture. There you go. Huh? Praying Scripture. Praying scripture. Okay. Yeah. The Word of God is, is true. If you pray, if the Scriptures say a particular thing that God does or wants, and you pray for that, that can be, that's in line with the will of God. What else? What are some other ways we can pray in the will of God? You can note, what's that? Uh, there you go. Asking that His will be done. Okay, so we see examples of that. We see Jesus doing that in the garden. We see an example from Paul when he had the thorn in his flesh. He prayed that God would take that away. Was that in the will of God to take that away? No. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. The answer is no. You're, you're going to keep that thorn in the flesh. Well, there was a purpose behind that, wasn't there? What was the purpose behind Paul's thorn in the flesh? Okay, trusting God, but there was a purpose in the fact that he had the thorn in the first place. The result is, afterwards, is that it's proven that when we are weak, God is strong. Humility, okay? He said, this thorn was given me to keep me from being conceited. Remember, he had had a vision of heaven, and that thorn was given for the purpose of keeping him from being conceited about that. And then all those things you guys said are true. As he works his way through that passage and he asks God to take it away, God doesn't take it away, he says, my grace is sufficient for you, he concludes then, then I will rejoice in my sufferings and calamities and persecutions and the whole list of things because when I'm weak, God is strong. His power is made perfect in weakness. Right? We know the Word of God. Uh, that's how we can pray in the will of God. We can love what God loves. We can hate what God hates. You find yourself in the will of God. We also need to get rid of sin. We need to confess sin as it, it is a hindrance to our prayers being answered. It's not always the reason why prayers aren't answered the way we want them answered, but it is sometimes. In Psalm 66, 16 through 20 says, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because He has not rejected my prayer or removed His steadfast love from me. Okay, we cannot cherish or love our sin and at the same time expect that we are asking in accordance with the will of God when we pray. See, the psalmist wants others to come and hear this amazing thing, right, that the knowledge that God hears and answers prayer according to His will is a comfort 
to the soul. He said, I will tell what he has done for my soul. But it started with confessing, repenting of our sin. It's exactly what John is doing in these verses. Look again in our passage at verses 14 and 15 in 1 John 5. Okay, he says, And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. And he says, it gives us confidence, meaning boldness, right? Not, again, not arrogance, not pride, not self-confidence, but confidence in the promise of God and the results of our salvation through Christ. And not only does it give confidence, but again, we can know something here John's talking about. He said, because we know He hears the prayers of His children. When, when they align with His will, we know He will grant whatever we ask for. When our, when our prayers are in alignment with the will of God, He answers those prayers as we ask them. What this should cause in us is a desire to know God and what He said. As, as Brandon mentioned, to know the Word of God. It should cause a desire in us to know that, a desire to be right with Him, a desire for His will to be done above my own, as Rosie mentioned. His will above your will or anything else. Do we always know what the will of God is in every situation? No, we don't. Then how do we pray? <laughs> then, again, we pray, go ahead, pray for what we desire, but acknowledge and submit to the fact that His will might be for a different outcome. His will might be a different answer than what you think. So we submit to that. You pray for what you want to pray for, but then acknowledge that God's will might be different and acknowledge, I will submit to your will, just like Jesus showed us in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. And if there's a different outcome, if you pray, I mean, maybe you've prayed for a loved one or a friend for years that they would be saved, and they're not. You've shared the gospel. You've prayed for them. That seems like something God would want to answer, right? It's not in His will, at least at this moment. By God's grace, it will be later if you're praying for a loved one. Maybe they haven't come to know the Lord yet. Because they haven't come to know the Lord yet at this time, it doesn't mean that they won't. But God clearly has not opened our heart to receive the truth of the gospel yet. So you don't give up praying, but you continue to acknowledge, not my will, but your will be done. So, as we think about these verses... We remember, again, that John is writing to Christians, and he has the purpose of shoring them up in their belief, the purpose for showing them that they can know that they have eternal life, and that by knowing that they have eternal life, knowing that they are children of God, that when they ask something in the name of God, when they ask something and it's in accordance with His will, God will answer it. He will answer your prayers every time. So, he wanted to encourage the people in that. And I think that's very encouraging for us as believers, that these verses aren't a terror to us, they're a promise that as we grow in our maturity as Christians, as we learn more about God and we grow in knowledge of Him, more and more our prayers will be answered the way we pray them because more and more over time, our ideas, our thoughts about life and circumstances will begin to align more and more with the will of God. So, it should be an encouragement to us. So next time, we'll see that these verses aren't, they don't just end there and have nothing relevant for the next verses, because they do, in terms of a brother or sister committing sin and, and how we deal with that. It's connected to this asking of God as well.
So we'll see that next time. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for tonight. Again, thank you for this word from from John, um, written so long ago, Lord, yet what an amazing truth that we can know that we have eternal life. Lord, as we have believed the gospel, as we have believed your testimony about your son, who he is, what he's done. And Father, that by putting our trust and our faith in those things for salvation, and not in ourselves, and not in anywhere else, but in the Son and His work on the cross, that you say we have eternal life. I pray you would help us, Lord, each of us in our thoughts to remember this, to be encouraged by it. I pray you would help us, Lord, to understand about prayer, There's so much we could study about prayer, so much we can learn about that, Father. But I pray you would help us with this truth tonight, Lord, that you answer the prayers of your children when they are in alignment with your will. If we ask according to your will, Father, you hear our prayers. That doesn't just mean they hit your ears and stop. But, that, Lord, you you take delight in, in answering those prayers. We're so grateful for that. Encourage us this week as we think about these things, Lord. You are a great and mighty God. You are sovereign over all things. Help us to understand that more and more and how that relates to our lives. Help us to have right thinking, Lord. Help us not to be fooled by false teaching about prayers and why prayers are or aren't answered. And There's so much silliness out there, Lord. Help us to understand that key phrase, according to your will. I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.